For the last several weeks, we've been learning about Elijah, who was a great man of God, so great that he's one of only three known people in the Bible to actually be in heaven right now with Jesus, which is an incredible honor. When I would learn about Elijah and Elisha when I was a kid, though, I was always struck by how there were so many cool stories about Elisha, and he didn't get as much attention. But here's why I think this is. Here's why I think that Elijah generally gets more attention on this. Elijah experienced some crazy dramatic things. The fire down from heaven, uh, the encounter on Mount Sinai, because he also experienced the pits of despair. Elisha's really interesting to me because we don't see him get that dark. He's really interesting to me because he just has this wonderful record of faithfulness and of not really wavering for the better part of his, of his time as a prophet. And we see this from the very beginning. At the end of the whole encounter on Sinai, um, Elijah, Elijah is given some instructions, and among them is to anoint his successor. So Elijah went down, oh, this is in your notes, by the way. Elijah went down and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. You know, this is, this is just how people made a living back then. Farm work. It was farm to table in the most direct sense of the word. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Kind of an interesting little gesture. But Elisha didn't just go, wait, why is this weird old guy throwing his cloak over my shoulders and walking away? No, he left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah and said to him, first, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. So Elisha knew exactly what Elijah meant with this gesture of putting the cloak over his shoulders. But he wanted to take care of some stuff first, and this stuff is very interesting. Elijah replied, go on back, but think about what I have done to you. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed the meat around to the townspeople, and they all ate. Then, and only then, he went with Elijah as his assistant. So get this. I just mentioned that what Elisha was doing there with, with his oxen plowing in the field is earning a living. There is nothing wrong with earning a living. So why does Elisha go back and destroy his means of earning a living? He's burning the boats. If you've ever heard the phrase burning the boats, it's said to date back to Hernan, Cort Hernan Cortez in the 1500s, but it's even older than that because the Greeks did the same thing, where they came with an invading navy, got, into, got to the island, it's always an island for some reason, that they're going to try to conquer, and then the general burns the boat so they have no option but to take but to actually take the island because they have no way of getting out, they have no way of retreating. Faith is focused on God. See, it takes an incredible sense of focus to burn your means of turning back and surviving while turning back. Do you get what I'm saying? The thing is that there's nothing with what Elisha was doing to earn a living. Farming is great. It's the foundation of civilization. Without farming, we would all be hungry, sick, and cold in the, in the middle of no shelter, exposed to the elements, because farming is a part of every part of that. It's not bad to farm. Elisha burns these things with the same zeal as an idol, because he has cut the noise out of the equation 
and recognizes the call of God for this specific task in his life. We all have things that we hold on to. We all have a lot of noise in the, in the, we all have a lot of noise in the equation. We all have something that God called us to do. It may not be something quite as dramatic or quite as history-making and history-breaking as becoming a prophet, but when God gives us something in particular to do, it's very tempting to hedge our bets. And right now, there are so many forces that make it so easy to get distracted from God. We have a noisy, a really noisy culture. There's the straightforward ones that we all know are distractions. Social media busting notifications at us every other second. There is media, but there's also our own fears and hang-ups. You see, focusing on God isn't just about eliminating external distractions. Some of us need to burn some attitudes that are resting in our own minds our fears, our insecurities. Because here's the thing, when, Ill, when God gives you a task to do, he'll give you the means to do it. It is an act of faith to block your retreat. So after this, Elisha has various and sundry adventures with Elijah. And I wanna take the time to read this from my physical Bible because there wasn't room for the notes to let it just unfold. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down together to Bethel. So Elisha will not be turned away once. The group of prophets from Bethel came to Elisha and asked him, Did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elisha answered, but be quiet about it. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Jericho. But Elisha replied again, As surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together to Jericho. Then the group of prophets from Jericho came to Elisha and asked him, did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elisha answered, but be quiet about it. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to the Jordan River. But again, Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. That is three occasions in which someone, in which Elijah himself told Elisha to stay somewhere and Elisha followed him anyway. That is three occasions in which the various prophets of the Lord said to Elisha, uh, you know that the Lord is taking your master today? And Elisha said, yeah, I know about it, shh. But he does it anyway, and he does it because he's loyal, not just to Elijah, but to God. See, faith is loyal to God. Loyalty is an, out, is an outgrowth of that focus. Because you can't be loyal without focus. You have to be thinking about something to be loyal to it. See, loyalty is sticking with who and what you know to be right, even when it's no longer convenient. Right now, a good many things are more inconvenient than they ever have been. If nothing else, this pandemic has been, to put it mildly, an immense inconvenience. Wearing masks outdoors, uh, not being able to hang out with our friends and watch fireworks this evening. So sorry, all the LA County fireworks shows were canceled. Anything you hear are your neighbors lighting off illegal fireworks. Um, 
There are so many inconveniences in our lives right now because of the pandemic. But, but, there are things that are still worth doing out of loyalty to God. See, all of you right now are expressing loyalty to God by persisting and worshiping God in this crazy, strange environment. It is so weird that I am talking to you through a camera that is going over the internet to your computer or tablet or phone, and that you're on the other side. I mean, it's a miracle that God can say anything through all these layers of transferring the communication. But you are doing it out of loyalty to God and to your community. And that's beautiful. That's so beautiful. See, loyalty is sometimes misunderstood as dry commitment or just habit. In reality, loyalty is a form of love. In fact, one of the most common words for love in the Hebrew scriptures is chesed, which is hard to translate, but it means one of two things, covenant loyalty or loving kindness. And it's very much tied to this idea of keeping our promises and keeping our commitments, but it's also kindness. This kind of love is not blind loyalty, but a loyalty based on knowing God, on trusting God, and seeking him earnestly because he sought us first. See, here's the interesting thing. Right now, so many of us in our culture struggle with loyalty to multiple things. And these things aren't necessarily bad. It's bad if your loyalty to a sports team is higher than something else import than something important, like your family, your God. Um, but there are things that legitimately claim our loyalty that it can be hard to prioritize, like our loyalty to our work versus our loyalty to our families. The beautiful thing about God is that when we are loyal to him first, foremost, in everything, above all things, he finds a way of helping us honor our legitimate loyalty to all of the rest. Are you confused and perplexed by how to manage your time in this new reality? Well, that's been a crazy issue before this. Give it all to God, having loyalty to him first, choosing him first, sticking by him, committing to him first, allows all the rest to fall into line. Because here's the thing, God is the expert at everything we need to go well in our lives. He is an expert at health. He is an expert at relationships. He is an expert at finances. He owns the cattle on a, on a thousand hills. I'm not saying that loyalty to God will make you rich. Anyone who says that should turn in their pastor card. What I'm saying is that God is the expert in getting you what you need and loyalty to him, while it's about him first and foremost, will inevitably be good for you too. But seeking God for his own sake, for his loving kindness, for his mercy, for all the good things he's done in our lives is the purest and most beautiful thing we can do and is what we're made for. 50 men from the group of prophets also went and watched from a distance as Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the Jordan River. Then Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it. The river divided and the two of them went across on dry ground. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, okay, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. How you read this is kind of interesting because sometimes in my head when I read this, it's like, okay, you've been following me all this way despite my telling you to stay here. What do you want? But it could also be that it finally got through to Elijah that he wasn't going to shake Elisha and it wasn't just about what Elisha wanted, that he was asking Elisha this because he wanted to honor the loyalty that Elisha was showing to him. Think for a second, if someone who was a known prophet with the record of Elijah to pull down fire from heaven, I believe at one point he raised someone from the dead, to do so many incredible things, asked you what you wanted, what would you ask for? 
think about it a second. There are a lot of things that people ask of God even when it's not offered by someone who has a track record of delivering. Elisha replied, let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. Okay. Faith is ambitious for God. Asking to become the successor of one of the greatest prophets that ever lived is a huge deal. This ambition does not come from his wanting something for himself. This ambition comes because he's at a place with God where he knows that this is God's ambition for his life. Ambition sometimes gets a bad name in Christian circles and in society in general. But ambition channeled in the right directions, ambition on God's behalf, is beautiful and good. Let me put it this way. Right now, a lot of people don't even have ambition on the radar. It's hard enough just to get by. I have been seeing over the last couple of weeks, over the last couple of months, a lot of people giving up even on the regular stuff of life. Before the school year gave up, I was hearing a lot about parents just not even trying to drag their kids to the computer to go to school anymore. I was hearing, I was even seeing with my own eyes students that are normally really on top of their homework and really on top of their academics ghosting, ghosting me. I, I saw, I've seen pastors who won't even record a sermon every week. I have heard from others who are normally ambitious ambitious in their witnessing for God say, why should I bother? The world's a mess. The world's falling apart. Why should I even bother if the world's going to end? There are some ambitions we need to give up on. There are bad ambitions. We need to give up on the notion of hanging out with um, people from all over for the 4th of July tonight. If you have not canceled, if you have not canceled your veggie barbecue yet, do that now for everyone's safety. But there are some ambitions we are not meant to give up on because God gave those to us. When God gives us an ambition to be an active and present parent, that is good and doesn't, you don't give up on it in this pandemic. When God gives us an ambition to serve a group of people, we don't give up on it because of the pandemic. When God gives us an ambition to serve the poor, we definitely don't give it up in the pandemic because they need it more than ever. If God gives us an ambition to take care of our bodies, I, I know, I'm touching, I'm touching on tender and sacred ground here, we don't give up on it in a pandemic. God gives us things to build. God gives us things to do that we are meant to pursue. And one of the most beautiful experiences that I've had in this pandemic have been watching weddings. It takes so much ambition and hope to get married in the middle of this pandemic. And it has been so cool to me seeing these couples who can't have their big, traditionally American wedding with all of the bridesmaids and the guests and the food and everything still get married because they know that God gave them the ambition to move their relationship where it needs to go. And they moved on and continued to live within the ambitions God gave them anyway. Faith is not giving up on the ambitions that count when things get inconvenient. Consider what dreams God has given you. Have you given some of them up? Maybe it's time to revisit them. Elijah says, you have asked a difficult thing. If you see me when I am taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. I've speculated at length about why Elisha needs to see Elijah taken to receive this. And I think it's one thing is that he needs, he needs to know that this ministry has been passed from him and that he cannot lean on his mentor anymore. He needs to have the boats burned for him. 
But also, if you were to see someone taken directly into heaven, how would that change your life? To know so concretely that God is real, to know so unequivocally that he's there. As they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, it, separates, it separated them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, my father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elisha tore his clothes in distress. People talk about an issue called ambiguous loss. It was, the phrase was first coined, I believe, to talk about prisoner, the, the spouses of prisoners of war who didn't know, of those who were missing in action, who didn't know if their spouses perished in the wars or if they were in prison somewhere and therefore didn't know whether to move on and date someone else or to be faithful and constant for someone who may not be coming back from war. What Elisha is experiencing here is an ambiguous loss. He, has, he no longer has access to Elijah, but he knows that Elijah's not dead. And that is such a strange place to be, just as we're in a strange place right now. There are so many ambiguous losses that we're going through right now. Graduations that are still graduations, but not as we know them. There are so many things like that, where we are losing stuff, but not entirely losing them, and we don't know what to do with that. And in those situations, faith can be really hard, because when a loss is cut and dried, they're gone, it's gone, there's no revisiting it. It's awful, it's painful, but there's a sense of closure. When there's loose ends dangling, it's so difficult. So what is Elisha to do? He just saw his master taken, and there's the cloak lying there. Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when he was taken up. This is a move of faith. Then Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River. He struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? In the text, it goes straight from there to what happens next, but imagine what it felt to be Elisha, sitting there by the shore of the Jordan River with that cloak, asking this question, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? There comes a scary moment in everyone's life where they have to make their faith their own. They have to own their faith. Up to a certain age, we get our picture of God from our parents. After that age, we get it from our parents and our teachers. But there comes a moment where we all have to decide for ourselves, is this the God of my parents only? Is this the God of my teachers or my pastors only? Or is this my God in who I trust? And as Elisha's asking this, he's already made a step of faith, but there's still room for him to question. Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He wants to have his own experience. He doesn't want to just have it secondhand, and we all need to do this. We all need to seek a direct experience with God. Then the river divided, and Elisha went across. God recognized his faith. It is very difficult to be faithful sometimes. It is very frustrating to be faithful sometimes. This week, an, someone who lives in my neighborhood called me on the phone and talked about what a bind he was in because he's a leader in his church which has already reopened, but his wife is immunocompromised. And he made the choice not to go back to church and it was one of the hardest things he's ever done or had to do on an ongoing basis. And I told him, you're doing the right thing. And he said, no one has given me that affirmation. There are so many acts of faithfulness that never get seen, that never get recognized by human beings. 
It is so hard to keep doing the right thing when you see others doing the wrong thing and you wonder if you're the crazy one for doing the right thing. If you're the one who is turning down the invitations to go places because you don't want to spread the virus, it is so hard to do that. But even if others do not recognize your faith, God sees it. Even if others do not recognize your focus, even if others do not recognize your loyalty, even if others do not recognize your ambition, God sees it. God sees what you do. There was a day and age when people talked about God seeing everything as though it were a punishing thing, but I think that it's a beautiful thing in that God does not miss the smallest act of devotion that you give him. In the Middle Ages, it was not uncommon for craftsmen to carve the inside of bricks for the great cathedrals. And when asked, why would you do that? No one's ever going to see it. They would say, God sees it. God sees it. We are all learning about faith during this pandemic because we are learning to keep relationships with our loved ones even though we can't see them. Our relationship with God is a lot like that. We, we cannot give up on him because we cannot see him. We cannot give up on him because things are difficult. God sees what we do and he honors what we do. Jesus spoke at length about how even though others don't see what you do, there is a great reward in heaven. But even if it turns out that we are wrong about God, even if it turns out that all of this is for nothing, it's not really for nothing. Because when we live as though God is real, when we live as though God is active, we live better lives. We do more for our fellow man. We live happier lives for ourselves. Maybe you're discouraged this morning. Maybe, maybe you've been trying to do the right thing and you're only getting punished for it. Maybe you feel like your loyalty is not being rewarded. Maybe you're having such a hard time focusing and you, you can't even figure out which boats to burn to move forward. Or maybe you've experienced the death of a dream. But God sees you. And he cares about even the smallest effort you've done on his part. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Thank you so much that you are abundantly faithful to us. Thank you so much for how you have not abandoned us. Human beings come and go in our lives and our access to see our loved ones come, comes and goes. But you are always there. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Show us what boats need to be burned so we can focus on you. Lord, Put our first and only loyalty in you so that all of the rest will follow. Lord, for those who have given up on a dream that you gave them, inspire them again. Show them that you still want them to do this thing that you've given them to do. Make the way clear for them. But Lord, if there's people who have gotten completely discouraged that their efforts are for nothing. Make yourself known to them. Lord, I thank you that you don't forget about us. I thank you that you are faithful to us. Make us faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen.